Hi, this is Ed Amorosa from Tag Cyber, and I'm here with uh, one of our icons in computing, computer science, uh, Brian Kernahan, who's currently a professor at Princeton and has had a wonderful career. It um, would almost take me an hour to walk through all the great accomplishments from his books to his contributions to programming to his even some of the more interesting things like having coined some terms that uh, maybe we'll get into later that I'll bet you use every day. But Brian, thanks for making some time to chat today. We're looking forward to the discussion. Oh, that's great, Ed. No, it's a pleasure. I had a great fun when we did this in person. Geez, what, four or five years ago? It was the only time I ever got to play Caroline's Club. So <laughs> sorry, it's going to be virtual this time. That's right. So we're filming this at the end of 2020. We're still in the pandemic, but you're right. A few years ago, we met together and uh, and you you were kind enough to to speak in front of a, our, our audience in, in New York City. But maybe we can do that again in the future. So looking forward to that. Brian, for, first thing, um, yeah, I mentioned earlier, you know, all these contributions to Unix and to and, and your amazing book, everybody loved the C programming book, but a lot of good ones since then, some really interesting contributions. Tell, tell us a little, just reflect for a moment on your uh, career when you think back. I know there's a lot still coming, but when you do think back, what are some of the things that you you find to be your your, your proudest accomplishments? There's a bunch of things that I'm really happy with in one way or another. I mean, clearly there's survivor bias here. If they <laughs> had not resonated with some people, then they wouldn't have survived and I would have been so happy. But but fundamentally, I, you mentioned the C book, um, and that obviously is in some sense the, perhaps the most visible thing. Uh, it depends tremendously on having had Dennis Ritchie as the co-author, his language, his reference manual, his you know amazingly good writing. So all of those things played into uh, a book that has actually done rather better than I think anyone would have expected. And it's still selling, even though it hasn't been updated and probably won't be uh, since the late 80s or something like that. So that's probably the most <clears throat> relevant thing in a way. Um, but generally, I think I've been happy with the books. The books are kind of on average things that last for longer than let's say uh, you know a technical paper in a journal or something like that um, and most of the books have been written with other people and so I you know I mentioned Dennis for the C book but of course Rob Pike with a couple of books and Al Aho and Peter Weinberger with another book on Auk and just things like that um, and so there's, I think there's a lesson there, which I kind of lucked into, which if you work with really, really good people, they improve your game. You get better at things um, or, you're, or you follow on their coattails or whatever. I'm not sure <laughs> the right thing. So I think the books are in some ways the most lasting thing, but there's also some uh, language work in particular. I, I spent a lot of time early on uh, experimenting with little languages, not mainstream things like C or C++, but, but uh, smaller things uh, like uh, oh, EQN, which is the language for typesetting mathematics, which Lorinda Cherry and I did, or Auk with Al Aho and Peter Weinberger, and a couple of random things on my own as well. And I enjoyed that stuff. I think doing little languages is a way to um, exercise some kind of weird creative uh, interests uh, and get something that other people might wind up using, but without having the just enormous workload of doing a big you know, mainstream kind of language, which is just harder work. So, but in all of these things, it's hard to overstate how important it is to have really good people to work with. You know, the well, I want to talk to you about languages in a minute, but in terms of writing about programming languages and programming, I remember Don, Donald Knuth did his literate programming where, you know, tried to weave writing with code. It seems like, the, the, in my mind, I'm, I'm just like you have read, hundreds of programming books. The thing I loved about the, the C programming book is that it reads so smoothly between the writing and the code and, and the themes. Is that, is that a, it seems like that would be a hard thing to do. It's almost an art to write about programming because you and I both have some really bad programming <laughs> books, right? I remember D Dijkstra made the joke once he was looking at a programming manual for something and it was like 500 pages. And he, he referenced his copy of some uh, physics book. And he said, this, this book can cover physics in 250 pages, but you can't seem to cover this language in less than 500 pages. And they made a joke about that. But I mean, am, am I reading that right? It seems like they're just, uh, it's very difficult 
to write about programming, to do it in a literate way? I Yeah, I think it's hard to do it. I, certainly the C book where I still remember basically endless time to sort of write and then smooth it out, try and rewrite, uh, bounce it off Dennis and vice versa. Um, and so we did a lot of that kind of thing. I think the other thing at the time, at least, and this would call it in the late 70s when we did the first edition, an awful lot of programming books were of the form of, here's the syntax of some construct in the language, and here is one or two or three totally artificial, irrelevant, who would care examples of that, that did nothing more than show you an instance in the syntax, but they didn't explain anything that you might ever want to do as a working programmer. And so what we tried to do in the C book was to come up with as many examples as we could, where it was something you might actually want to do if you were a programmer, try and get some job done. And, um, and I think that's hard. And I think if I look at, for example, online uh, you know, tutorials and web pages and so on today, a lot of them still don't do that. They say, oh, here's the syntax of the print statement. And then they show, you know, print expression, common expression, and then they say print three, 17, whatever. It's completely boring and largely irrelevant. So I think it's I, it's sort of an art form to do that. But again, it's survivor bias. And uh, yeah, it's hard. But I know that that was part of what we did uh, very much in the C book. And Rob and I certainly did very much the same kind of thing in the Unix programming environment book, where we really, really tried to get examples that somebody might care about enough that they would learn from them. Now, this concept of, of, of little programs or, or, or software tools, as I think you, you, you'd help coin that phrase and that concept, I always admired that and tried to stick to that in my own work. But I sense that um, that's not always the case anymore. It seem, seems like we've gone through a period in computing where bigger programs are the norm, uh, things that do a lot of things, some big complex things. Tell us a little bit about that design philosophy. Do you see that coming back? And I'm guessing with your, your students at Princeton, you probably going to go on, a, go on a limb and suggest that you recommend that they modularize and focus. But what's kind of the difference? And do you think we see a little bit of that maybe coming back? We see micro-segmentation architectures, maybe smaller is better. I, what, what are your thoughts on that? I don't know. I, I don't do enough of what you would call real world programming at this point to be sure. But my sense is that most of the people I know who are programming professionally are working with very, very, very large things. And so they're enormous and they are not the sole person working on something or even in a small team, but the whole thing is very big. And so there's a bunch of people working on it um, and they're building what they're building on top of many, many, many layers of software that somebody else has written. And so, you know, their development environments and libraries and frameworks and APIs and so on. And you just, you know, it's kind of hard to see what's going on underneath all of that. And then when something doesn't work, what do you do? Um, and unfortunately, <laughs> I do this myself, of course, you just say, oh, I don't know, let's look it up on Stack Overflow. And you find some piece of code and, you know, half the time you say, that can't possibly be right. And the other half it says, well, maybe, and you try it, but you don't know whether it works or not. So I think in some sense, that kind of programming, building really big things on top of other big things, you're too far away from what's underneath. And so you lose the sense of it. And, and, and in many cases, it seems to me that you'd be better off actually to reinvent the wheel, you know, find some little wheel that's actually the wheel you want, and then just go and build it. Uh, so I'm not sure that I would build my own string copying routines or something like that. But you know, that that level of thing. And so I try to, when I'm teaching programming to kids at Princeton, I will try and explain some of that, I will try and show them what goes on underneath. What's the simplest example code that you could write that would, for example, put something in a database and get it back out again? And so, you know, I can write very simple C code or Python or whatever, and I can run SQLite instead of some heavyweight thing. So you can sort of see what's going on uh, and that kind of thing. And then the other thing you wondered or asked about sort of is, let's call it the command line environment sort of thing. <sighs> Well, warning, there'd be dinosaurs here because I honestly think that, that the command line environment is an incredibly powerful, productive, effective way to do programming for, let's say, professional programmers. Um, 
And so I do most of my work with command line kinds of things, the, the Unix tools that were sort of standard 50, almost 50 years ago, um, because it's easy. Now those, that's for certain kinds of things, uh, exploratory data analysis, I wanna know what's going on, or I've got a half-baked idea for a program, I wonder if it would work. It's easier for me to do that kind of thing at the command line, because then I can see what's going on. If this task I'm doing I can break it into inter, into individual subcomponents and see the intermediate states. Okay, I did some simple process. What's the output? Ah, not quite right. Try it again. Now send that into the second piece of it. What's the output? And so on. So rather than building a big thing that will do the whole job, sneak up on it in smaller pieces, each of one, each one of which does part of it, and you can see what's between the pieces. So it's the pipeline stuff in some form, and I often don't even use the pipeline. You put it in temporary files so you can see what's going on. I downloaded something yesterday that was nine megabytes of JSON. Oh, what the heck is going on? It was actually the documentation, the so-called documentation for a, an API that was expressed exclusively in JSON. And it's right. like, this can't be the right way to, so anyway, I, I, you know, simple programs and, and one of the Python modules I use all the time that cracks open the JSON and puts each thing on a line by itself so that, that I can grab it. Right. Now, I could use something better, but that's close enough. This uh, quote that I think was attributed to von Neumann where he said that, um, for small mechanisms, it's easier to understand how they work. And for larger things, it's much easier to just look at what they do and have no clue how they work. So yeah, I thought right. that was an interesting thing. Now with your students, curious what, um, what strategies do you use to teach them programming? Is it just write a lot of programs? Are there methodologies? Are there uh, language biases that come in? Are there, what, what's been your experience? Cause you've been doing it for a while. You've been at Princeton for 20 years now. Right. And you see taught all of us programming before that. But what, what, what advice do you have for, for folks who are watching? Probably a lot of computer science profs watching us right now um, who teach programming. What do you think? Any, any thoughts or any advice for them? I, well, I think the basic thing is to write lots of code because, you know, it's a contact sport and sometimes you have to actually do it. You know, I have, <laughs> it's embarrassing how many programming books I've read about, you know, language X for some X and I think, oh yeah, okay. And then I try to write a program in X and I, I can't make it work. So uh, so doing it, actually writing code, I think is um, a good idea. Um, I think you need some formal training in these things. It's not enough to just write the code, but to have some idea about what are the basic ideas in your language? Uh, how do you express data structures and things like that? How do you divide big programs into smaller pieces? All of those kinds of things that are part of a, let's call it a more formal or abstract understanding of programming. So you wanna do some of that. Um, <clears throat> I do a lot with the tools. I mean, I, I expect the kids in my class to actually learn how to use the shell for crying out loud. A lot of them don't know how. <laughs> so, so that kind of thing, small tools like the, the standard Unixy things like grep and awk and so on, know about regular expression. So this kind of core stuff that I think is kind of like just basic literacy in a certain kind of programming. Um, so I do a lot of that. And then sort of like the, I'm not sure it's the von Neumann picture, but we use networks all the time. We use databases all the time. How do those work? And so I would in a typical class spend you know, a lecture or so on, here's the absolute basic stuff about networking. You know, How do you open up a connection and do something? What's going on underneath there? What's the minimum bit of code that you could write that would send something over a network and get it back? Um, and the same thing for databases. You know, what's the minimal thing that you could do to put something in you know, MySQL or SQLite or something like that? Um, the other thing that I try to do probably to excess is expose them minimally to different programming languages because there's more than one way to write things and different languages kind of encourage different ways of thinking about how you program. Um, so I teach a mock, for example, <laughs> which is obviously self-serving in a way, uh, but in some sense, I think you get more bang for the buck with awk than any other programming language because in five minutes you can learn enough to be really useful 
Um, and that's not true of any other language, I think, realistically. Uh, but I also make sure they know Python. It used to be <clears throat> nobody knew Python. Now everybody knows Python, so you don't have to spend so much Very time. Very popular with language. Exactly. I used to do some Perl. I don't anymore because I think, you know, regrettably, it's probably not the right choice. And one thing I don't do, um, and this is, I think, a failure on my part, but it's covered by other people, is I don't talk enough about functional programming. Uh, and the reason is that I think in day-to-day -day life, functional programming is not used by most programmers most of the time. But an enormous number of really, really good ideas have come out of the functional programming world and find their way into uh, sort of, let's call it more mainstream programming languages and environments. I mean, literally yesterday, I was reading something about how Excel has added lambdas. Okay, so Microsoft announced the idea of lambdas in spreadsheets. Okay, <laughs> so there's two worlds fairly far apart. To the, uh, to the horror of security engineers everywhere. Well, I pass on that part. That's your job, not mine. <laughs> but there's a good idea, right? And, and something that came out of uh, many years of experience in various forms in the functional world showing up in uh, something that's very much different in, in, in a kind of weird programming environment. So I do that. Um, something else that I think is important for people in school, it, it's fairly easy to give small scale programming assignments, you know, write a program to do something. And the trouble with that is in the real world, you typically don't write a program to do something. You don't start from scratch. You find yourself in the middle of a team of people who are working on something big and you're given some piece of it and, and you know, go fix that or add a feature or whatever. And so I've tried to do that with some of my assignments, which is to say, okay, here's a moderate sized program, not very big, and I want you to do something to it. It's reasonably well specified what to do. So go do it, make sure you don't break anything else. Oh, by the way, write a bunch of tests mechanized so that you can verify that what you did didn't screw up things and works. And so, um, <laughs> and again, this is one of these self-referential things. I use awk because the version of awk that I have still, that Alan, Peter and I wrote years ago, is pretty small. It's only 6,000 lines of C or something like that. And so I can say, okay, add a different kind of for loop or add some kind of you know new built-in function, something like that, add a new comment convention. Um, and then, back to what we talked about earlier, write some shell scripts that will run mechanized tests where the mechanized tests are basically little language kinds of things. So you specify a test as a very specialized language, write a shell program to exercise those and tell you when something goes wrong. So I can put a whole bunch of things into that one uh, lesson about drop you in the middle of a program you've never seen before. Yeah, I want to talk to you about programming in the context of, say, computer science. So you, you and I have both seen that there are these say, training institutes where they'll teach you to, uh, to program. And you may have no background in computer science or in mathematics or when you study music and, and you learn to code. It, it reminds me, you and I both as undergraduates studied physics. I was also a physics undergrad. I remember doing electronics and asking one of the professors, why do we need physics to do electronics? And the answer was, you don't. You can build electronics and know nothing, but if you do it in the context of physics, you have a deeper understanding of what's going on. Is that kind of the difference? You know, like, because there really are competent programmers who don't have CS degrees, but how do you resolve that? Is, is, is programming something that must be done in an academic, the learning in an academic setting, or could, um, you take someone off the street and put them in a programming institute class, and if they're intelligent, they can learn to, to code. What, what, what do you think? I, I think absolutely you can take people so-called off the street. It's helpful if, that they be intelligent and motivated. Um, and sure, you can absolutely teach them uh, to program, and they can become exceptionally good programmers. I think it's helpful to have the broader base of sort of a formal understanding and training in uh, some of the underlying things so that, for example, you actually understand a bit about computational complexity just to, enough to know that, you know, linear is better than quadratic, which is in turn better than exponential, those kinds of things. Uh, but it's not you couldn't learn those too. It's just the academic setting gives you more of that 
The other thing is the academic setting is a forcing function. You actually have to do the stuff. <laughs> and somebody at the end of each semester tries to assess whether you did it or not. And so there's, I'm not sure objective is the right word, but there's an external assessment of how well you're doing on that. And, and along the way, then it's sort of forcing you to learn particular things in a sequence and coverage that's thought to be useful for what you're doing. I don't have enough experience uh, with the, let's call it the boot camp kind yeah. of uh, yeah. situation to know how well that works in the long run. And when I read something about that on sites, so I don't hacker news or something, it, it seems ambivalent to me about whether that's a great deal, uh, a terrible deal, or more likely just a spectrum of results in the middle somewhere, which depends strongly on both the people and the schools that are doing it. I, I, it's an example. I, I remember trying to write a compiler in graduate school. I don't know how you could do it without understanding automata theory. I mean, with, without that understanding grammars, I would. I, I, I mean, I remember struggling, I, like sleeping with uh, Per Brink Hansen's book. Remember that one, the Pascal compiler book. Also, a book that compiled, compiled beautiful book, right? You could yeah. compile the text of the the manuscript. But without the theory, I, maybe someone else's brain would work differently, but I, I wouldn't have been able to do it. I still was pretty crappy at doing it, but I was able to get it done because I just thought grammars. But it seems like the theory is kind of necessary. Like I do see these boot camps all the time. We see them in security a lot. And I, I've not been a huge proponent. I'm, I'm okay with, I want people to better them. Not everybody can could study at Princeton University. I, I understand that. And I teach at NYU, and I know we, you know, we don't. We, you get a very select group of people. Not everybody can or should be there. But I do think, like for some programmers who may be watching us speak now, I'd encourage that. Um, I don't know what you think, but I think a little bit of the computer science would be wise, even if you're not in an academic setting. Maybe a program of self-study on Coursera or something where you. Yeah. Does that make sense? It seems like that theory does help. I, I think so. And, and you know, compilation is one of those things. Compilation used to be very, very, very challenging kind of thing 50, 60 years ago. And then people started to understand it in a more theoretical sense. You got a notion, okay, what's involved in parsing? Gee, and there are algorithms that work and algorithms that don't. And then there are faster and slower algorithms and they have their properties. And it's not like you have to be able to create those algorithms or certainly not prove theorems about them, but at least to understand that they are there and that they may be encapsulated in various tools that you use. And that's one of the reasons why the tools may work well or in fact may not work well. Um, so regular expressions is a great example. Okay, so regular expressions have been around since Chomsky or even earlier, Cleany, I guess, way, way, way back. Um, and regular expression code is one of those places where the theory really tells you what you should be doing. But then there's also this incredibly challenging engineering to make sure that you get the theory to do the right thing at a reasonable speed. And, and the example that keeps coming back to my mind is Al Aho's work on eGrep, because the theory says, oh, you can take a non-deterministic finite automaton and then you can parse anything and no backtrack and so on. But the trouble is you get a state space explosion. <laughs> and so it takes you forever to build the machine that's going to then recognize quickly. And what Al did was to couple his understanding of the theory with a very good engineering notion of lazy evaluation. Let's not do this until we actually have to. And all of a sudden, the whole thing becomes basically linear. Um, and, and so that kind of thing, that balance between the theory and the practice is important. The act parser generated that Steve Johnson did, same kind of thing. So, so I think it's not that you couldn't write a really crappy regular expression recognizer. Uh, I've done it. <laughs> But you could do a boatload better one if you understand what's going on there. And you'll know which one to use if you understand kind of what the properties are likely to be. So, Brian, I want to talk to you a little bit about research. Um, you know, I had the great privilege to be starting at Bell Laboratories when you and many of the other uh, great icons in, in computing were working there, Murray Hill. I remember I used to try and walk down the hall and hope that some of your genius would waft into my head. <laughs> I don't think it ever did, but um, but at any rate, I'm curious what, when you think about research. I mean, we're both in computing, but but maybe even broader, just in technology. 
What do you think of the current state of technology research in the United States and, and globally right now, um, both in academia and in, in industry? I know that's a gigantic question. I'd just ask, well, you can take that wherever you see, but, but you were part of a team that I think in my mind represents almost an ideal environment for doing research. It was well-funded, it was largely unconstrained, but there was some direction and there were a lot of very eclectic, creative people together without too many managers telling you what to do. That to me has always seemed like the ideal environment. I'm curious, does that environment exist? Is it at Google? Is it at any universities? Is it in China? What, what do you think right now when, when, when we talk about research, what sort of comes to mind? Well, the, what you described at Bell Labs in what we'll call the good old days uh, was absolutely Essentially, you hit it on, on the, the nail on the head in that there was, a, I think, a very unusual combination of circumstances. The company, AT&T, which owned Bell Labs, had an exceptionally long time horizon. They really measured things in decades. It was not measured in quarters. And so that made a lot of, you know, don't have to think instantly. The other thing is there's a very stable, steady, predictable revenue source. And so uh, a piece of that could be peeled off for thinking about and investing in the future. And there was this sort of social contract between AT&T, which had a monopoly basically on communications um, in the United States. Um, the, the, the social contract was that they would get this stable revenue source and so on, but they would pump some of that back into making the service continuously better. It always getting better um, and including things like universal service to everyone, which is one of the company uh, mantras, if you like. Um, and then it was the phone system was a very, very complicated, big, talked on many different uh, areas. Um, and so there were always all kinds of interesting technological problems to work on there. And so if somebody came to Bell Labs, it didn't matter what their interests were. There was some place where they could be contributing something useful. But... The management, A, was technical, so they understood this, and B, they too were not measuring things by the quarter, but rather by the long-term thing, and so they were pretty hands-off in a benevolent and, and good way. And so that meant, taken all together, that lots of good things came out of it. But that's, a, as I said, a unique kind of combination of circumstances, and I don't know that anything today is like that. Um, there are certainly big, good industrial research operations in some sense. Google has uh, obviously many, many people particularly doing things in um, machine learning, artificial intelligence, but lots and lots of other things, chip design, you know, power consumption and energy saving, just all across the whole map. Uh, <clears throat> Microsoft is similar. Facebook, probably some, not as much, maybe more focused. And I don't know them in detail. So in some ways, there's some of that similar breadth, but I'm, I'm not sure that the forcing functions are the same, and I'm not sure the stability is the same, and I'm not as convinced about the management structure either in all of these things. So, so you know, Bell Labs may have been a singularity. It was not the only place at the time either, right? Think about Xerox Park, which was very much smaller, uh, but had a similar sort of corporate master, but it's probably even more decoupled from their corporate masters than Bell Labs was. And they produced some really, really good things at roughly the same time. I mean, we're using Ethernets right now, and that's a Xerox Park contribution, and we're using bitmap displays and that, you know, so, so Bell Labs was not unique, but it was certainly quite unusual in that respect. Would we get something like that again? Or, so that's the industrial side. I simply don't know. The university side, the problem with universities, a problem, uh, first is money. It takes money to do this kind of stuff. Um, and so I think people at universities spend a lot of their time basically hustling money so they can support their graduate students. And so rather than doing research themselves, they're very often kind of managers whose job is fundraising so that their graduate students can do the research. Um, and the other thing is that there are pressures on faculty 
any random faculty member in computer science could probably double their salary by going to pick your favorite big company, especially if they're in the right kind of area, like if you can say data science. Um, and so that's a pressure as well. Uh, that means that people are distracted, I think. And in addition, I mean, one of the things I remember from, from Bell Labs long ago, it had many of the advantages of university, freedom to work on what you want, um, and at the time, money and good facilities and excellent colleagues all around. Um, and it didn't have the, call it the mixed blessing of dealing with students, okay? So teaching takes time, uh, administration takes time, all of those things. Now, of course, the flip side is, especially with students, you get a tremendous amount more back from them than you ever put into it yourself, so that's fine. But, but there weren't those at Bell Labs or other places, except in the form of interns or something like that, people who would show up for a summer, but not, uh, but you didn't have that sort of day-to-day, uh, -day, oh my God, I got to teach a lecture tomorrow kind of feeling that sometimes can also interfere. So, so on both the industrial and the Academic side, I don't know what's likely to happen. I think we're not going to see another Bell Labs or even a Xerox Park kind of environment, but there will certainly be <clears throat> lots and lots of good things that come out of these operations, particularly the big, well-funded ones, which have enough cushion that they can think about the future as well about the, the next five or ten minutes. Yeah, it's always struck me as odd that China has not stepped up. I've actually written a little bit about that. Like if I asked you to name a great tech company from China, in my world doing security, you wouldn't be able to do it because they don't exist. Now they do an AI, uh, which I'm going to ask you about in a little bit, but it just seems to me that a lot of the same conditions are certainly there that um, thinking in terms of decades or generations as opposed to immediate term, that's certainly something that you see very frequently there. And also this idea that there would be the ability to fund uh, teams that wouldn't have to be, because that is one of my horrors as a professor, uh, both at Stevens and NYU. You're right, you spend an unbelievable amount of time talking for money, looking for, yeah. to my horror. But, um, it just always surprised me that um, some of these, uh, like certainly China, uh, has not, there, there hasn't been the, uh, the, the version of Bell Laboratories sort of popping up out of China, all these new ideas pop up and we'd be referenced, we would have referenced them in the last half hour of our discussion, but we haven't. So uh, who knows? It's a, certainly an unusual thing. I, and I resonate with your point about um, the fact that faculty can double their salary. If, if um, you know, if you're dealing with somebody, um, I don't know, like doing um, teaching, um, I don't know, political science, I, I guess they could go to K Street as a, as a uh, but mo for the most part, you know, you're, you're in the dream job if you're teaching political science at a great university. But computer science, you're right, it's always <laughs> this, this draw to moonlight, you know, spouse says, hey, let's, let's go make some big money at uh, Microsoft, and a lot of people do, so. I want to ask you a philosophical question about computing. I've said computing a number of times here and gone back and forth between computing and computer science. And I know you've been, you've been a full-time academic at one of our great universities. Uh, so maybe you think about this, but do you think that computer science really is a science? Like sometimes when you read the definition of science, like Feynman would make a big fuss about what is science. He would explain to lay people what science, and it was always fun. You can find them on YouTube where he goes, hey, we guess at stuff and then we do experiments and then it was this way of doing it. But I, I tend to think that what you and I do doesn't look like it passes much, any of the criteria for a legitimate science. It looks more like an art to me, but what, what do you think? Like, do, you, do we have any laws? I don't, I can't think of one. What, what, what do you think? Is it a big misnomer? I th I think it probably is. Uh, well, let me say it more positively. I think it's probably a combination of uh, art and science. There's a, a lot of things in which if you understand something that well, let's call it science and or engineering, I'll, I'll lump that in. 
as we were talking about earlier, you can do an awful lot better job. And I think understanding that kind of thing is important. That's sort of the basis of you know, what's underneath what you're doing. Uh, and thinking that way, thinking more or less formally or rigorously about what are you trying to do and how would you know if you did it um, uh, is, let's call it a scientific component or part of um, computing. But then there's, I think an awful lot of it is art. How do you put these things together into something that satisfies various criteria, some of which are firmish, like, you know, how fast does it run? Does it fit in the memory? Uh, things like that. And some of which are much less tangible, like uh, how well does it work for ordinary people who have to use it in some sense? Um, and how, how do they respond to it? Um, do people think, wow, that was really nice. I like that. Or do they think, oh God, I have to fight it every time I turn it on. And that's getting that right. Let's call it more the human interface side of things, I would say is much more an art at this point. So it really is a combination of these things. Um, and, and science versus art is, I think, just a little too focused uh, because there is so much engineering component to it as well. And so at least some places, including Princeton, to draw some sort of line between science and engineering. Engineering is doing things with constraints, basically. Well, that's a good lead in to artificial intelligence. So I'm curious what you think. There's all this hype that, um, you know, the, um, the promise of machine learning and deep learning and other algorithmic techniques that collectively form this uh, artificial intelligence umbrella, that it will somehow transform our world. And again, I'll go back to a, a Dijkstra point. He, he made the joke frequently that when new sciences pop up, they lose their minds, like, and then they have to filter out the crazy, like alchemy needs to be pulled out of chemistry and numerology pulled out of math and astrology out of astronomy. And he would yeah. joke that artificial intelligence is all the kooky create life stuff out of computing. Um, curious what you think, is there's all these different, like you read about the, you know, some people saying that AI is going to, you know, take over society. It's as big a problem as, say, climate change. And others might say, no, this is just, you know, the next generation of Knuth algorithms. And, you know, relax. You're just labeling things and learning. Well, where, where do you stand on that spectrum? Well, I'm, let me preface it by saying I am not an expert on uh, AI or ML or any of the things that go in there. Although, oddly, I did my undergraduate senior thesis at Toronto in 1964 on artificial intelligence. And that was a time when the same sort of hype, but, yeah. you know, you know we, will, we will play games, we will translate human languages, we will prove theorems in mathematics, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, we'll have all that working in five or 10 years. Um, and of course, <laughs> it stayed five or 10 years for some while. And then funding dried up, got the first of the AI winters. Um, and then people came along later, and let's call it the 80s and 90s with expert systems where, you know, you know everything. So we'll just, you know, you will tell me everything I need to know about security. I will write that into a program, and then it will be a security expert, and you could retire. And that didn't work either. And so we're in a third phase of that kind of thing, I guess. Um, enabled at this point by tremendous amount of computing power, much, much more than we ever had, and tremendous amount of data upon which you can do things. And then a new sort of paradigm, which is, we don't know how to do these things. Let's let the computer figure out how to do these things, basically by looking at a bunch of examples and figuring out parameters that will kind of give you better answers in the future. Uh, and that has worked, I think, stunningly well for certain things. Image recognition is really, really good in a lot of cases, not perfect. Um, and there are special cases of image recognition which are dangerously imperfect, like face recognition in particular, because for all kinds of reasons, including training and implicit bias and so on, it doesn't recognize some classes of people, for example, people of color, just all kinds of things that say, well, I can recognize cats, and I could do a really good job, and it doesn't matter if I get it wrong. Can I recognize people? And it may actually matter if you get it wrong. And we see all too many examples where it does matter. But you know, fundamentally, image recognition is a place that's worked well. Um, speech recognition, real-time captioning of like what we're doing right now is actually works surprisingly well. It's automatic, not maybe not real-time, but not too much processing after. 
Um, translation is pretty good. Google Translate does a bang up job on all kinds of things. Uh, as far as I can see, it's really pretty darn good. So those are what I would call uh, examples of success in artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, and of course, game playing in particular. Uh, Going to play chess or go or whatever, you haven't got a prayer against uh, the current state of the art programs, period. I mean, just forget it. Um, so, so all of those are successes, but in a way, they're arguably not the hard cases. I don't know what the hard case, but but if an, an algorithm for something like, I don't know, resume evaluation or something like that uh, assesses a bunch of resumes and it says, interview this person, interview this person, don't interview that person. How do you know what it's making its decisions on? And how do you know which of the assured biases in the input data are then being faithfully reflected into the decisions it makes on the other side? And that's something I don't think we understand. One of the hot areas in machine learning, in fact, is sort of accountability and fairness in algorithms. It makes a decision, a program makes a decision, it hasn't told you why it made it. What are the implications of that? How do we know that it's doing a proper job as measured by whatever we think a proper job should be? So I, I think that is a real serious limitation of artificial intelligence. There's a wonderful XKCD cartoon, I should have the number in my head, which basically, you know, this is steaming pile of stuff. And, and one guy says, is this is your, your machine learning algorithm? And the other says, yes, and it's, it's a pile of linear algebra. And, and the first guy says, but how, how do you know when it's right? And he says, well, you just look at the numbers and if it doesn't look right, you stir the pile some more. And so I, I'm not saying it nearly as well as Randall Monroe said it originally, but that's the idea of it. That in some sense, you just got a bunch of, let's call it linear algebra, and it produces answers. And if they confirm your biases, it's good. I mean, isn't that the antithesis of software tools? Like the idea of understanding it in, on a CLI, what you're doing. Like if you and I were talking, I'm, I'm also not a machine learning expert, but sadly in cybersecurity, you're not allowed to distance yourself from that. So I've had to sit and, um, and learn as much as I can. And what I've learned is that the more expert you become in machine learning, the more you realize that nobody really does understand how these algorithms come to a conclusion. You set them off, you create this sort of approach, but then how it then executes is, is almost too complex to predict. So for the same reason that you're not really sure why that chess algorithm is beating you, how did it know to do that? You know sort of that it's just playing five steps ahead of you. But I, I, it seems very unsettling that all these things that um, that you and I were talking about just a little while ago, software tools and simplicity, are really the antithesis of this, um, you know, this this approach to programming and computing, it worries me a little bit. I, I don't know. Let, let, let me ask you: When you hear people talk about this, um, like AI taking over, <laughs> like the, like, <laughs> I, mean, I I always say just unplug the darn things. Maybe that's a, just that seems a little too deliberate. But do, do you when you hear that, do you, do you also sort of uh, be skeptical about this idea? Like I think humans will misuse computing much faster, ruin our world than computers <laughs> will do it. But what, should we lay awake worried about computers taking over? I don't, I, not in any uh, direct sense. I mean, the, what, singularity or, you know, killer robots or whatever. I'm not too worried about that kind of thing. I think there are places where people are using AI and, sorry, as I was hinting earlier, I'm a little skeptical. Uh, face recognition, particularly in aid of law enforcement, seems really, really, really bad idea. Um, and uh, things like resume, you know, filtering or something like that. Mm, a little cautious about that too. Amazon scrapped one of their resume filtering things a couple of years ago because it had been very carefully trained on men and therefore it was just, you know, oh, you don't want to hire women. Well, <laughs> kind of a dumb idea. So, um, so I worry about that kind of thing a little. And I had some rhetorical flourish to go along with that and I lost it. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, one, 
Well, well, let me pr propose a scenario that people come up with fr frequently that I think is sort of creepy, but it plays to the algorithmic nature. Like, you know, I've been married for 30 something years and my wife and I met each other in college and I married. We've been together for decades and it's been great. But if if some piece of AI had been watching me from birth, <laughs> you know, watching everything I type and everything I Google and all my emails, it might have told me in my mid 20s, no, 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 there's this other person over here that our algorithms give a 99.8743% chance of marital success. You should listen to me rather than, you know, go. I mean, you could imagine a very odd state of affairs. We, I guess people do dating that way now, but you can, well, I know you teach a, a popular course at uh, Princeton and sort of computers in our world. Do some of these topics come up to sort of these societal impacts of computing on day-to-day -day stuff? So I don't know. I mean, I'm sure the, the, the dating thing doesn't resonate for you and I, but you could imagine for young people now, a reliance on technology to make key decisions in your life, the career you should pick, where you should put your money, um, what who you should vote for, you know, all these crazy implications that I can imagine my little Google screen telling me now, because it already tells me what movies to watch and what books yep. to buy. Well, what, what do you think about all that? Well, it's interesting. <laughs> Back uh, well before, I, I mean, my wife and I have been happily married for 50 years and uh, and definitely was not uh, machine mediated. But um, one summer, the summer of 66, well before I met her, um, I was going to be spending the summer as an intern at MIT in Cambridge. And I didn't know a soul there. And a, a thing called Operation Match had just come on the marketplace. And it was basically, you send us whatever, 10 bucks, and we'll give you the names of five women. Tell us about your various aspects of personality. There weren't very many. And so it, in fact, lined me up with five young women in Cambridge. And meeting them, they were all perfectly nice women. And it was clear how the my components and their components had somehow matched that what the al you could almost see an algorithm at work there and the trouble was that even though they were very nice people there wasn't a hint of chemistry period i mean it's just eh. <laughs> as opposed to probably the same thing that you encountered with your wife i met this woman i thought wow this is really great um now that was a long time ago obviously um Today, presumably, there are many more components in the vector of, you know, would you be compatible with this person? And I, it does seem like a fair number of people meet online, but whether did they meet by dating systems or did they meet through something else like shared interests or mutual friends or whatever online? I don't know. One of my former, not exactly student, one of my... Uh, teaching fellows at Harvard years ago is as part of the OkCupid okay uh, operation. And so <laughs> he must know something about it professionally uh, more than I do. But back to your real question, what happens in a class like the one that I teach in the fall, which is for very non-technical people, the typical person in that class? Well, this year, I think <laughs> that there were sort of three philosophy majors and, you know, several history majors and a couple of English majors and some classics majors and some people doing Near Eastern studies and you know, all over the map, no technical. Um, but a lot of this stuff does show up, all of these as of how does computing show up in the world around you and what should you be doing to think about it? Uh, a big part of that is the privacy and security aspect. I think if I extrapolate from the kids in my class over the last few years, they just do not understand the degree to which they are being tracked all the time by uh, both primarily commercial operations, which know far more about them than most other people do about them. Um, places like Facebook in particular, where it's just an astonishing amount of information uh, that is known. And so what I do in the class is observe not so much the astonishing amount of information, but rather look at all the stuff that's watching you as you wander around the web. And so we talk about cookies and we talk about JavaScript tracking and we talk about canvas fingerprinting and all these kinds of things that are the mechanisms by which information is collected about you. And of course, some of that is voluntary. If you go to Facebook and you say anything, then all of a sudden Facebook knows more about you than you volunteered that information. Um, but they also collect it 
from all kinds of other sources like tracking, and they can buy information from data brokers so they know what money you spent on your credit card for various things. Um, so a huge amount of that kind of thing, and I think the kids are unaware of that. They're unaware of how much cameras and location tracking and things like that that their phones are doing, and their phones are on 24 hours a day. Um, and lots of other things that they use or do that are at the same time monitoring them. <clears throat> so making them aware of that kind of thing has been one part of the course. And I think it's surprising to most of them. <sighs> there were two kids in the class who say, I don't use Facebook. So that's 10%. That's not too bad. <laughs> so, like, so Shana Zuboff wrote the amazing book on surveillance capital, right? From, uh, yeah, just, yeah, right. It's, it's so fat that it's... Uh, it says something just that you could write that many pages about the problem. But she says exactly what you're saying, that um, we basically traded these quote unquote free things for us being the product. And, yeah, and right. for a lot of people, I've never been comfortable with that. But, you know, I'm, I may not be the. I mean, I'm, maybe I'm over the hill. Uh, most people yeah. don't seem to mind. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm two generations older than my students, at least, and I just can't conceive of it. But the other thing is, not only are you giving the information to Facebook, but you're paying people like Amazon to collect it. How many of these kids have Amazon Echoes or the equivalent kind of thing that's listening to them all the time? And, of course, Amazon is increasing their reach into your house. Amazon Ring and something like that. Amazon drones that will fly around inside your house. I just... Thank you. No. <laughs> so, well, you know, as an extension of the work and the course that you teach, you've talked a lot about big numbers, you know, the, um, you know, and, and how, how to deal with um, interpreting numbers. There's the I forget who made the joke. Somebody said um, years ago, you would say um, astronomical would be a word to describe something big. But now you say economical. <laughs> <laughs> You know, a million is not very big anymore, but, you know, a trillion dollar debt is more. You know, but what, what, what are some what's an advice that you have for people? Because you and I live in this world now where we're barraged with data, most of which is just nonsense, absolute yeah. nonsense. How do you deal with that? And I know you've written extensively about that. Yeah, well, I, I mean, put in a plug for the book sometime, but yeah, exactly. Um, I think there are techniques that you can use to assess numbers. You see a number, like you, you talked about debt or something like that. And I saw an article in the uh, New York Times some years back that said the national debt was something like $4 billion. Okay, and you think, oh my God, huge amount of money, et cetera, et cetera. But how do you assess that number? So one way you can assess that is say, what's my share of the national debt? And so if it's three billion, call it three billion for arithmetic and there's 300 million people, my share of the national debt is something like $10, right? Ah, so I could, instead of buying a couple of extra cups of coffee, I could pay off the national debt or we could get Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos to pay off the national debt and they wouldn't even notice it. And of course, it wasn't billions, it was trillions. And that changes it because now we're talking about, you know, five or $10,000 per person, and that's harder to deal with. So one rule of thumb is to say, here's a big number. What's my, what's my share of it? Now, to do that, you have to know things like what population are we in? The population of the world, the population of the United States, maybe my city or town, something like that. But you know this. You need a handful of those numbers. Um, Plausible, simple plausibility. Is it plausible that it's only a billion dollars when there's nearly a billion people? Nah, not terribly plausible. Um, uh, there's a sort of reasoning backwards, and I guess that's what we were doing there. You know, if this number were true, then I would have to pay four dollars or six dollars or whatever. That can't be right. Therefore, what I started with is wrong. So you can do that kind of thing. Um, there's numerical shortcuts and rules that you can do. So we've been talking. Uh, probably as a society, enormous amount about uh, COVID uh, and pandemics and things like that. And there are plenty of examples in there of exponential processes where something is growing at a fixed amount per fixed percentage per period of time. And being able to reason about exponentials is a useful thing. There's this thing called the rule of 72, which says you take the rate at which something is changed, is growing per unit of time and you divide that into 72 and it tells you how many periods it will be before it doubles. So if the number of cases is doubling, oh, I don't know, every month, 
or something like that, let's say every 36 days, then that says it's growing at 2% a day. Okay, so that's one part of it. And then another part is to say things that are doubling, 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 that's an exponential growth. And there's a relationship between the powers of two and the powers of 10, approximate relation, two to the 10th, 10 doublings is 10 cubed, a thousand. So if something doubles 10 times, then it's a thousand times bigger. And then if it doubles another 10 times, it's a million times bigger. And so if you apply that to some of the numbers that we are seeing lamentably right now about the exponential growth in cases of COVID infections and deaths, you can see that if it keeps going like that, there'll be nobody here. Now, exponentials have to stop. You can run out of something, but it does tell you that, that they kind of go out of control if you're not careful. Um, so yeah. that's... The, on, on COVID, um, you know, again, we're filming this sort of in the at the end of 2020, where right now we seem to be back on an exponential. It seems mm -hmm. like the number of cases, deaths, and um, hospitalizations, and and you can see it visually because when you see slope go like this, yep. you don't have to have a PhD in statistics to know that that means in a very short order of time, I'll be much higher versus an S curve or something. But as you look at the data, or as anybody looks at the data, what are some ways to make sense of, of this? I mean, we, I, I look at that Hopkins data almost every day, but I'm curious yeah. what, what advice you have for people. And then it'd be specifically about COVID, but it's a darn good example. I, know, I don't so. want it to be a political thing, but I, I, prefer, you know, I think it's it's a discourse that we're all living through now. What what do you what do you look at? How do you look at those numbers? Well, I look at those, and I do the same thing you're doing, and I just look at the shape of the curve, and it says, "Geez, it keeps <laughs> like it's going up, and it's not going up linearly. It's going up like right. this. If right. you plot it on a log scale, and it's going up linearly, then you're screwed because that's an exponential. Right. And so I look at the graphs. Um, you have to be careful of graphs because there's lots and lots of trickery that goes into making graphs that will convey an impression that isn't necessarily correct. Yeah. Um, and that wonderful book by Daryl Huff called How to Lie with Statistics. Uh, love that book. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful book. Um, <laughs> it has some great examples of that. And, right. and modern technology has simply made it possible for people to do even fancier versions. Like having a scale from one to a thousand, but just showing the tip of the scale and not showing yeah. is very much like turbulence on an airplane measured from the ground to the plane is a very, very minor ripple. But if you move the scale up, it looks like you're swinging wildly up and down. So I assume yeah. that's what you mean. You can yeah, right. That's totally an example. Play graphs and make them look funny. Yeah, yeah. That's a, what Huff calls a gee whiz graph because basically you're throwing <laughs> away a lot of the data. Um, and so it stretches the scale. And sometimes it's appropriate and sometimes yeah. it's not. Like if you're in the plane, yeah. you actually want to know that you're moving up and down 100 feet instead of two feet. Um, that's right. That's so right. it's... It's not like it's necessarily bad, but it's something you have to be aware of in a sense. Um, so there's a lot of the graphical trickery that you see. Another thing that you see, and I think you actually see it in the um, the numbers for infections in COVID, which is what you might call specious precision. You notice that the, the thing on the TV has the number of infections to seven figures every day. It's 14 million, da, 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 all the way out. And I think it's hard to be that accurate in counting things. And it's probably a, a truly good faith effort on the part of the Johns Hopkins folks and everybody else, or almost everybody else is doing that, but it's hard to know things that accurately. And so when you see in general, let's not focus on the COVID stuff, but when you in general see something where a very large number is given to a very, very high degree of precision, you have to be a little cautious about it because how could they know it that accurately? So that's another one of these warning signs that says, hmm, somebody's maybe grinding an ax here because numbers that have lots of digits in them carry a sort of authority that they probably don't really have. So you gotta worry about that kind of thing. Um, other places where people go wrong, um, the mean versus the median of a distribution. You know, if you and I and Bill Gates walk into a bar together, the average net worth of people in there is a boatload more than it would be if just you and I walked in, right? And that's the mean, whereas the median would still be kind of like normal people. And so, again, it's a, a statistical summary of something where you have to be a little cautious about 
So what is it that we're looking at? And there are places where the, the mean is just fine, just the arithmetic average, and there are places where the uh, median is a better measure because it kind of discounts the outliers. So I think watch trends, this thing. I mean, it's tre trending, certainly in security, is a big thing. Like in security, we learned this from Dorothy Denning like 25, 30 years ago, where you look at a thing, and then you look at that thing again, and then you look, let's say on an annual basis, you look at this thing, and you develop this confidence that for the most part, things are predictable. Like in the United States, we can more or less predict, sadly, how many people will die any given year. I mean, yep. it goes up and down a little bit, but if for 20, 30 years, you could more or less draw next year's graph, more or less. Yep. And, and that to me is unbelievably powerful in the context of things like COVID, because when all of a sudden I see this big lumpy thing that shows up out of nowhere, and it didn't look like any of the others, in cybersecurity, we call that an anomaly. Right. And we use the behavior analytics to, to point out that I don't know what's causing this, but something is going on and it might be hacking. So we'll, we will see. It's going to be interesting to see how our society learns to interpret numbers. And I hope, I hope they buy your book because the things are very, very relevant. You know, we li like to close interviews, uh, Brian, with a little bit, maybe just looking forward a little bit into next year and beyond. When, when you're asked, and I know you get asked uh, from time to time to make some predictions about programming and technology and education and society. I'm sure your students would say, you know, where, where are we headed with some of this? Are there a couple of themes that come to mind, positive or negative? In my world, when it's security, I'm usually pretty pessimistic because I think the <laughs> hackers are, but you mentioned privacy and other things. What, what, what do you foresee for 2021 and, and subsequent years? What, uh, what's in your crystal ball? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's attributed to many different people, but um, I guess most plausibly to Yogi Berra, who said that making predictions is hard, especially about the future. So, <laughs> so be careful about that. I, I mean, you mentioned privacy, and, and that's close to your business, obviously. Um, I think that's one where we are going downhill, uh, that there is less and less uh, personal privacy, that there are more and more assaults on it uh, from uh, commercial interests, obviously, uh, that Shoshana and Zuboff's uh, surveillance capitalism is a nice early indicator of that, and I think it's getting worse, not better. Uh, governments are increasingly wanting to watch us. The attacks on, uh, for example, oh, we have to have backdoors into cryptographic algorithms. A nice example of you know, government wants control, the fragmentation of the internet that we see where various countries are interfering with traffic across their borders. China's Great Firewall, for example, the story this morning in Kyrgyzstan, I can't remember one of the stands, um, where everybody has to register, um, has to use a government supplied certificate so that the government can know what they're doing and in fact intercept. It's a nice man in the middle attack. Um, so I think privacy in, in that sense is going downhill, and that means that our security will be going downhill with it because it will be harder and harder to do things that somebody isn't watching over your shoulder about. So that, that's a big one. If I had to pick a single thing, that would be it. It's related to the big issue of just control. You know, All kinds of organizations want to control individuals, and individuals have relatively little defense against this. Um, so I would worry about that too. What else? Um, I, it's interesting to see whether computers will continue to get faster and so on. That's kind of one of these obvious uh, questions and, and I don't know an answer there. I, my personal feeling is I don't care whether they get faster. My, all my computer, I'm using a 2015 machine here and it's plenty fast enough for anything I ever want to do. Why would I need anything faster? Um, but that's for me as an individual. I have a cell phone that isn't turned on. I haven't turned it on for going on several days because um, it's a surveillance mechanism. <laughs> um, and so I don't need a fancy new cell phone. I, you know, ones that are three, four, five years old are just absolutely fine, at least until they changed the technology underfoot again, and then I may have to buy one. Um, so there's a lot of places where, in some sense, a technology curve is kind of plateaued enough that, you know, why, why would we bother to update? And that will have, for personal use, that will simplify my life. And for companies that depend on a continuously increasing market, 
it will probably have a negative effect on them. It's like, gee, you can't count on people buying a new iPhone every year or two, or something like that. Uh, what else would I worry about? I, one thing that I think is going to increasingly be a problem, it's already a big problem, and it's going to be more so, is jurisdiction. Uh, who gets to decide? Uh, you know, the United States says you got to do things this way, and the European Union says you got to do things that way, and who rationalizes that? Um, like in the uh, EU, there's the GDPR that basically says consumers have rather more rights to their own data and more defenses. And in the United States, there's nothing like that with the possible exception of the CCPA in California. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and in both of those, one worries about some flavor of regulatory capture where the, the law or whatever gets kind of watered down because the people, the only people who are interested in it are the big companies who have vested interests. So, so I can see all kinds of uh, issues in and around that. Uh, we've talked about AI. I predict there will be plenty of bad uses of that, along with the really good ones. Um, I could see good ones that would really be helpful, like uh, medical imaging. It's a nice, right. example. Yeah, right. I mean, really, really important thing there. In fact, almost near perfect radiology kind of uh, interpretations. Yeah, that's very, yeah. very welcome. Yeah, I think so. I mean, retinal uh, examination is another one that I'm more familiar with, um, where again, the uh, image recognition is. Or the you know recognizing eye disease in some sense is uh, at this point better than the average you know man on the street clinician as opposed to specialists, um, and that's a benefit of a research operation at, at Google and other places. So, yeah. Yeah. so you know, technology is a two-edged sword, and I suspect that on balance we're going to be better off more or less all the time because of it. But there's going to be plenty of places where it's not true and it doesn't affect individuals uniformly. So the technology that makes it possible for us to sit here in the comfort of our homes and have a nice conversation, there is a boatload of people out there in the real world who are paddling a hell under real dangers to try and make that work. Well, Brian, I'm so glad that you're taking the time to, to teach non-majors about computing. I think that's essential. Um, Absolutely congratulate you on all the wonderful work. I'm, I'm, I know you and I both uh, were teaching virtually this past semester, so um, I don't know if you're enjoying or not enjoying that. I don't enjoy it, but it sounds like you may be having a little better experience. But listen, if, if people have some interest or want to correspond with you, I'm sure on your um, on the internet, um, on the Princeton uh, Computer Science page, looks like your uh, contact information is there. Uh, they can write to you. Maybe, maybe they'd have some... Uh, might be other uh, professors considering these courses for non-majors, which I think is a great idea. I, I, I think uh, too many computer science um, uh, experts think think that that's um, you know some sort sort of beneath them or something. I think that's crazy. I think it's the greatest challenge of all to explain the technology to non-majors. So I pre appreciate you doing that, and thanks so much for taking a good solid chunk of your day. Uh, to share with us. It's always wonderful to reconnect. Oh, that's great. I had really good fun. Thank you very much. Um, hope to do it again sometime. You bet. Stay well, stay healthy. And for everyone else watching, I will see you all next time.